It's so good to be outside today. And it's always good to have a change of pace. Sometimes, you know, you get so used to doing the same thing over and over and over again that you begin to lose feeling. You begin to lose the emotion attached to what you do. You just do it over and over again. But I'm so glad that on this bright morning that the sky is the roof over our praise and worship service. I'm so glad that the church is as God desired it to be and that there are no walls. The only wall that you see is the wall holding up the church. But there are no walls. Everybody could hear us praise. Everybody can hear us pray. Everybody can hear the word of God. Everybody can see what goes on in little old Antioch Christian Church. So to everyone, I welcome you. If you are a visitor, I welcome you into the church whenever you feel so led to come inside. You will find open arms inside Antioch Christian Church. Again, the message of today is about setting your house in order. You know, some of us know that there are some things that we left unattended in our homes. We said to ourselves, I'll get to that later. And guess what happened? Later became later. The days turned into months. The months turned into years. The years for some people turned into decades. And that thing is still left undone. God is not like that. I'm so glad that God is not a procrastinator. How many of you know that God is not a procrastinator? How many of you can attest to the fact that when you prayed, God answered your prayer? God didn't make you wait a hundred years to answer your prayer because God wanted you to know that God is. How many of you know that God is? God didn't make you wait to answer your prayer an ex extraordinary amount of time because God wanted you to know that he cares for you. God wanted you to know that he loves you. You know, some of you don't even love yourself in the manner in which God loves you. You think that you have done so much wrong that God does not even want to be associated with you anymore. But I'm here to tell you this bright morning that God wants you to know that he created you and he created you in love and he will do everything possible to save you. He will do everything possible to have a relationship with you. There was this thing that God knew needed to be taken care of. He knew that man in his, in his infinite wisdom that man has, which he doesn't, but sometimes man thinks he has infinite wisdom. Isn't that interesting that sometimes man thinks that his infinite wisdom is comparable to God's infinite wisdom? Let me tell you, God knows that man is limited, but man wants to lean to his own understanding. But God said, no, I'm not like that. I'm not a procrastinator. I know that men and women and children have this propensity to disobey me for whatever reason. But God said, I want to have a relationship with men and women and children. He said, I'm not going to destroy the earth like I did it before when the floods came and only Noah and his family were saved. See, God honors his promises where men and women don't. Amen. See, when it's, it's cloudy today and when it rains later, we hope to see a rainbow, which is a reminder of God's promise not to destroy man in that fashion ever again. But God doesn't forget his promises and he honors them. And he said to himself, man, let me tell you, these people, they are trying my last nerve. Everything that I do, I give them things that they are not even deserving of to show them my grace and my mercy and my love for them. And they still don't get it. How many of you know that people today still don't get it? 
I see not too many hands raised because some people in the church might think that they holy and they got it. But my Bible tells me all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The only difference between you and those people who reside in these houses, some of them being Christians, some of them not, is that you know God and you know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. And see, when man saw, when God saw that men and women and children were leaning to their own understanding and, and satisfying the desires of their flesh, instead of satisfying the desires of their spirit, God said, you know what, I'm going to do something about this. You know, thank God again that he is not a procrastinator because he devised this plan where he said, I have this son and I'm going to sacrifice my son so that his blood would cleanse all believers of their sin. And it's not only meant for believers. I want everybody to know that God sacrificed Jesus Christ for you. Right. It's personal. God knew you before you was born. He knew the things that you was going to do before you even did them. And he said, I got a plan to bring you back to me. Amen. He didn't say I'm going to bring the pastor back to me. I'm going to bring the deacons back to me. I'm going to bring the trustees back to me. He said, whosoever will believe that I love them, that I care for them so much that I hung my own son on the cross and held back all of the angels in heaven from rescuing him so that I could save you. God wants you to know he's not a procrastinator and he saw that everyone needed to be saved and he took an action and spared not his son so that you might have life and have life more abundantly. Somewhere in the plan, he and Jesus, after Jesus died on the cross, and on the third day, he was resurrected from the dead by the Holy Spirit. And then after walking the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, he ascended up to heaven. And he's sitting at the right hand of power, that power being God. Amen. Jesus Christ said, Father, they're not going to be able to do it on their own. He said, we're going to have to send them a helper. Otherwise, they will be lost and no one will come to us. And so they got together and they said, we're going to send the Holy Spirit. Amen. And the Holy Spirit is your helper, Amen. your comforter. Amen. Let me tell you, this life is a struggle. Amen. This life, even as a Christian, this life is a struggle. Anyone who says once you believe in Christ, your life gets better, that's not true. That's absolutely not true. When you believe in Christ, and you have the Holy Spirit, you have a friend that helps you along. How many of you know that you need a friend in this life? You can't make it through this life on your own. At some point, you will be brought low by what happens in this world, and you're gonna need a friend. Even if you have to cry on their shoulder, you're gonna need a friend. Even when you don't feel like going on anymore, you're gonna need a friend to push you and tell you to take the next step. Amen. I have learned a mighty long time ago, even though sometimes I like to be by myself, being by yourself is not always good. Amen. That is why the church is meant to assemble, whether it's inside or outside the building, to fellowship with each other and to give testimonies, testimonies and edify each other. I want the world to know and everyone who can hear my voice, we acknowledge that life is a struggle. Yes. You can ask the innocent man who sits in prison for a crime that he didn't commit if life is a struggle. You can ask the mother and the father who lost a child to crime if life is not a struggle. You can ask the person who feels like the only way to provide for themselves and their family is to commit crimes if life is a struggle. You can ask the person who lives in terrible living conditions each day. You could ask them if life is a struggle. 
You could ask the person who's walking the streets all times of the hour or sleeping in their car or on their van, in their van or on railroad heating vents in the wintertime if life is a struggle. You could ask any homeless person that you see. You could ask people that you drive by and you see begging for money if life is a struggle. The struggle is real. And the struggle impacts kings and queens. It's not only limited to poor people. It's not only limited to middle class. It is everyone is exposed to the struggle. I want you to know that in the first year of a king named Hezekiah, he saw what was going on in God's kingdom. And like God, he was not a procrastinator. See, it's very interesting that you could say that you are a Christian and you procrastinate when God lets your eyes see something that needs to be resolved and you don't take care of it. But Hezekiah wasn't like that. He saw something that was out of place and he said, I'm going to take care of it. Second Chronicles chapter 29 verses three through five. It says in the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Then he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them in the east square and said to them, Hear me, Levites, now sanctify yourselves, sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers, and carry out the rubbish from the holy place. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. Hezekiah did not procrastinate. He didn't say, I will take care of that tomorrow. He made a decree and he gathered all of the leaders of the Israelites at the time, known as the Levites and the priests. And he said, come here, I want to tell you something. It's interesting that certain things happen in God's kingdom on people's watch. And they let it go unattended. And God has to send someone to say, hey, that ain't right. Hey, that needs to be attended to. And that's what Hezekiah did. He called all the leaders, the priests and the Levites. And he said, come here, I want to talk to you. You've been letting something go by on God's on, on your watch that is offensive to God. And I need you to fix it. How many of you know that in your lives and in your homes, there are things that you are allowing and permitting to happen and you're not addressing it? Hezekiah said, you need to address this. He said three things. He said, sanctify yourself. Sanctify yourself. How many of you know how you sanctify yourself? And don't say take a bath or shower. That's not sanctifying yourself. Matter of fact, if you was to get a microscope and look at your skin, after you take a bath or a shower, you would be amazed what you find on your skin. So let me tell you, soap and water is not sanctifying your body. When God, we know that when God says sanctify yourself, God is not talking about your flesh. Because my Bible tells me that those who worship God have to worship him in spirit and in truth. Therefore, God is more concerned with your spirit and the state of your spirit than the state of your flesh. See, so many people say, God, take care of my flesh. God, take care of my needs. But they never ask them what is truly the apple of God's eye, which is your spirit. Because hello, somebody, your flesh will cease to exist, but your spirit goes on and on and on. And God only cares about those things that go on and on and on. So the term to sanctify yourself means that you need to wash yourself spiritually. Now, how do you wash yourself spiritually? It says, John chapter 17, verse 17, when Jesus was praying to his father before he ascended into heaven, he said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. 
Let me tell you, if you are going by days and days and weeks and weeks and months and months and you're not reading your Bible and you not, are not meditating on God's word, you are not cleansing your spiritual being. So Hezekiah said, you need to sanctify yourself. You can't be a priest and be dirty. Oh, let me say that again. There's some people who were priests and thought they could come and serve God any kind of way. And let me tell you my Bible, because I read my Bible. My Bible tells me that I am a priest. Matter of fact, God told me that in his word that you are priests. So let me say one priest to another. You can't be a priest to God and be dirty. You better find that word and start sanctifying yourself. Start washing your spiritual armpits with the word. Start washing your hair and your head with the word. The other thing that Hezekiah said was, sanctify your house. You cannot be a priest of God and serve God dirty, nor can you be a priest of God, sanctify yourself, live in a house that's not sanctified, and think that your sanctification and your holiness that you got through the word is not compromised. If you walk with a nice clean garment, white that you got out of the cleaners, and you begin to, it rains, and you walk through, with, through the rain with that garment, and that garment is all the way down to the bottom of your heels, guess what happens to that garment? It becomes dirty. That is why Hezekiah told the priest, sanctify the house. You have to sanctify your house because God is, he looks at you in a 360 degrees, a full circle. And God wants every aspect of your life to be sanctified. So you must absolutely begin to sanctify your homes. When you see something going on in your home and you know that it's not right, God gave you a spirit, not of fear, but of power and a sound mind and of love. So you're supposed to go in your household and correct things in love using your power and your sound mind. Hezekiah told him, sanctify the house. What did he mean by that? He didn't mean to read the word in the house, which you should do. What he meant was dedicate the house to God. Let me tell you, there's so many people who go into churches and you think by the way that they live in the church and the way they behave in the church, that the church is for them, that the building is for them. But the building is not for you. The building is meant for God, a place where you offer up sacrifices of praise and worship. Too many people say to themselves, oh, I'm the president in the church. I'm the vice president in the church. I'm the money changer in the church. I'm the choir lead in the church. God didn't create his church for you to benefit from the things that you can get out of God's church. God created his church to be a hospital that heals people who come and that he sends to it that have physical and spiritual ailments to be a healing place. It's not for you to come in and to prop yourself up. It's for you to pour yourself out so you could help in the healing of somebody. There's too many people in this world who are ailing, who are sick, who just need a friend, and they come to the church looking for friendship, and you don't come to the church looking what you can get out of it. 
You sizing that person up saying, should I make this person my friend because they're a corporate person in a high place or they're well connected or they got some money in their pocket and maybe they can begin to give it to me. No, that's not why we are here. We are here to help God's created people. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. God loves everyone. God created everyone. And he spared no means to get them back. So when they come into God's church, or when the church goes outside, what people should see is our love. We should not judge anyone because the Bible says the way that you judge someone, God will judge you in the same manner. So let nobody walk by this church and you cast a judgeful eye at them. When someone walks by this church, even if it's not on Sunday, my expectation is your pastor is you say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to them. My expectation is that after you say that to them, you say, God bless you, and God continue to bless you and your family. That is the expectation that God has of God's people. Let me tell you, God didn't plant this neighborhood in the church's environment. God planted the church in the neighborhood's environment for the neighborhood to experience the goodness of God that the church can bring to it. So God, through Hezekiah, told them, sanctify the church. Sanctify the house of the Lord by dedicating every action that you take to achieve the goal of God, which is to encourage somebody. Don't worry about leading them to Christ. If you encourage them and you show them love, they will follow the path that leads to Christ. Everybody comes in and say, oh, come here, I want to lead you to Christ. I'm, I would look at them like, what, what, what are you talking about? What has Christ done for me? I don't know a man named Christ. You want to lead somebody somewhere? I'm going to back up off me. I don't know you like that. You just come into my neighborhood on Sunday and some Saturdays and then you disappear. Ooh, does that, out, does that, does that hurt somebody? Ask yourself, what are you doing for this neighborhood? Too many people want to hold all of these events to pull from the resources of the neighborhood. I could look in Africa and see how that has been done over and over and over again. How Africa was raped of its resources by the people who just saw it for what it could take. That is not the way to church. Dedicate the house of God to God. Be a light to the neighborhood. Don't worry about what the neighborhood is doing for you. Worry about what you can do for the neighborhood. Jesus Christ felt the same way. Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 through 17, it says, Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all of those who bought and sold in the temple. You see how people misuse God's place for their own gain? And he overturned the tables of money changers and the seats of those who sold us. It amazes me when everybody comes through and they want to sell you something. They're looking to see what they can, how they can benefit. Jesus Christ saw it and said, get up out of here. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. In this scripture is the reason why you have to sanctify God's house. It's the reason why you have to dedicate God's house to God. It's the reason why you have to dedicate your service and your ministry and your energies to God. Because the Bible says that there was no healing of the blind and the lame in the state that the temple was in. Oh, you didn't get that. When there was sin in the temple, when there was selfish gain in the temple, there was no healing. There was no blind people. There was no people, in fact, coming because they knew 
that miracles was not going to happen. If you want miracles to happen in the church, then get the church right. And then the people will come. Because the Bible says, then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. There's another thing that you should understand. That if Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of power, and he is, and if he has discerning eyes and he can see everything like God his Father, then that means that God sees what's going on in the church. Oh, you're not hearing what I'm saying to you. That means that God sees what's going on in the church. And the things and the blessings that God wants to give to the church, the church will never have until it gets itself straight. But here's the problem with the church. There's true, too many churches that are okay with the blessings that God just takes out of his pocket and says, here, you can have that. He takes it out of the other pocket and says, oh, you can have that. Those are the things that God gives with his grace and his mercy. But I don't want those blessings from God. I had plenty of those blessings from God. I want God to see what the church is doing at Antioch. I want God to see what I am doing in my life and say, oh, wait a minute. This ain't enough. I need, oh, oh you, you're not following what I'm saying. I need God to say, this ain't enough. I need to go into my treasure chest. So hold on one second. I'll be right back. That's what I need God to do for me. I don't need them regular blessings anymore. I want the church to be right. So God pours out a blessing that you cannot hold it. Do I have anybody to feel the same way that I do? As Moses said, who is on the Lord's side? So God said, sanctify the house through Hezekiah. And he didn't only say that. See, some people think that they can sanctify them, the house and sanctify themselves. And that's all. That God is going to go into his treasure chest and grab some serious blessings for you. God said, get rid of the rubbish. He said, get rid of the rubbish. Because too many times, oftentimes... There's things in the church that the church doesn't even use. And it's just sitting there gathering dust. And God through Hezekiah said, get rid of the rubbish. I want you to know that the word is applicable to your life because Hezekiah said it to the Levites and the priests. Hezekiah is speaking it in the word. God put it there so the churches might learn from it. God wants you to know that people... Some of you have sanctified yourself. Some of you have sanctified your house, but you have rubbish that you need to get rid of. You are holding on to idols in your house. Things that have these meanings to you. And God is saying to you, don't I have meaning enough to you? Why do you have to hold on to that when I'm the one who allowed you to have it in the first place? God wants you to know that there, and I don't know what it is, only God and you know what it is. God wants you to know that you have rubbish in your life. And when you say the word uh, rubbish, it means that it may be precious to you, but it's really just junk. How many of you have things and you say, oh, that, oh that's, if I was to come in your house and say, when's the last time you used that? And you would say, oh, it's been a while. And I would say, okay, get rid of it. No, it has this great meaning to me. I'm hold, you hold it on while I'm pulling it away. No, don't do that. God calls it rubbish. Let me tell you another reason why you need to get rid of the rubbish. Because last that I look, unless some of you tell me you have mansions with rooms, 
that you don't even use. That you got space like that. You, my space is not that big. And so if I have rubbish in my household, guess what? How is God going to put something into my household if I got rubbish in my household taking up the space? Start cleaning out that rubbish. Start cleaning out that rubbish. You ain't used it in six months, a year. Guess what? You don't need it. And don't throw it in the garbage. Maybe there's somebody, one man's garbage is another man's treasure. Give it to somebody. You, imagine that. You holding up rubbish, things that are so precious to you that you've outgrown. Things that you no longer have a use for. Don't you know somebody else needs it? Let me show you this. When you hold on to things that you've outgrown, when you hold on to the blessing portion that God's given you, and you've got more than you need, you are preventing a blessing. And God told me in my Bible that he wrote that what you do and how you measure out things, the same will be done unto you. So when you're holding back a blessing from somebody else, some of you are not getting it, so let me complete the thought. When you're holding back a blessing, God will hold back the blessing that he has for you. Get rid of the rubbish. Most of the rubbish that you got is not pleasing to the Lord. And some of the rubbish can be used by somebody else. Sanctify your house. Don't think that you can get by without sanctifying your house. God sees all portions of your life. And guess what? All portions of your life count. God is interested in every nook and cranny about your life. And God wants you to know that don't feel bad about those things you've done in the past. They're in the past. He wants a relationship with you. And all you have to do is say, Father, forgive me. That's all you have to do. I want the world to know that whatever you have done, all you have to say if you want a relationship with God is, Father, forgive me. God bless you. God keep you. Heaven smile upon you. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray that for all of those that have a house, for all of those that have a self, that they need to get in order, that you begin to get your house in order. Amen.